Good morning. My name is John and I'm one of the elders at Teddy Baptists and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our live streamed service. It's just one notice this week. If you're on our mailing list, then you will have received a draft version of our new church profile by email on Tuesday. On Wednesday evening, 40 of us joined in a good Zoom church meeting and had a chance to talk about it. But if you have any comments or bits you wish to add, then please email one of the elders. This week, our speaker is the Reverend Graham Meeklejohn from the Baptist College, starting our new series on the Book of James, and we'll have the chance to speak to him in a Zoom chat after the service. Details for how to join this will be in the church notices email. So now let's start with some praise and worship. God in Christ has revealed his glory. Come, Come let, let us, us worship. worship. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the, the Lord's name is greatly to be praised. Give him praise, you servants of the Lord. Oh, oh praise, praise the name of the Lord. The glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Let, Let us, us rejoice and sing God's praise forever.
Morning, great to see you. I'm going to talk to you about how we can communicate with God more. Just through prayer, just through prayer. There's a lot in those words. And Jesus gave us a real template for talking to God through the Lord's Prayer. In the same way that at the minute we're using social media more to talk to friends and family, maybe even writing letters, taking time out to catch up. This is what Jesus says we should do when we wish to talk to God. And the Lord's Prayer he gave us, I'll read from Matthew 6, 9 to 13. He says this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Quite a long passage, but you can break it down into four ways. The first part, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is basically saying, I love you. You're amazing. You're the God of the world and the universe. And we wish to enjoy all the good things that you've given us here on earth now in a way that we will receive in heaven as well. The next part, give us today our daily bread, is saying thank you and please look after us. Thank you for giving us what we need, both to eat and in things that we're doing and that we don't need to worry about it. Thank you. The next and third part is saying sorry. Forgive us our debts. Also, we also have, as we also have been forgiven by our debtors. So saying sorry for the things that we've done wrong and appreciating that he does forgive us and that asking that we will also forgive others who have done wrong to us. And finally, it's help. It's Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Help us not to be tempted. Help us to do the right thing and walk with you and be great disciples for you. That's what the words are. I've now chosen a song we can all sing. There are actions which will help to remember those people who need help to remember all the parts of the Lord's Prayer and I hope we enjoy it together.
Hi everyone, you've just seen the Magnitude promotional video for the online youth festival that's happening from Sunday evening the 26th of July until Tuesday the 28th of July. This year the youth groups in Tillicutri and Alva will be joining together to do a camp out at home event. So what does that look like? Well, we're going to participate in the Magnitude live events and they will be live streamed at Magnitude Scotland throughout these dates and then after the events are finished we're going to join on zoom as a group to have chat prayer and games and at evenings young people and leaders will find somewhere in their house maybe their living room garden kitchen bedroom floor as long as it's not actually their bed because that's not camping to camp out and we'll also participate in some activities during the day that magnitude are also hosting and on the Tuesday evening, we will be having a camp dinner and games on Zoom. So if you're a young person and you want to come and join us, then please get in contact with us and let me know. And please, as a church, can you be praying for this event as young people hear from God in the seminars, in the talks, in the group discussions afterwards. And this event is happening across Scotland. So please be praying for our group, but also for all the other groups that will be participating in this event. Thank you, take care, bye. Reading from James chapter one, verses one to 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits for all he created.
Good morning and thank you for inviting me to share with you this morning. It's a real privilege to share in your service despite the current circumstances. The given passage for today which we've already heard read is James chapter 1 verses 1 to 18. For many this passage will be entitled Trials and Temptations and I want to fuse this passage together with a question that the book of James asks later in chapter 4. In James 4 verse 14 the writer poses the question what is your life? And in many ways this question is at the heart of the book of James. So this morning I want to ask what is your life in times of trials and temptations? Perhaps even more pointedly I want to ask what is your life in a time of coronavirus and Black Lives Matter? We live in times of trial, a virus spreading across the world. We live in times of temptation, a prevailing social order that benefits some and oppresses others, which is so easy to ignore when you're the beneficiary of that social order. But the book of James, and in particular this introductory section, challenges us to meet head on the question, what is your life in times of trial and temptation? I've spoken at Telecutri Baptist before, but it was a couple of years ago and as part of a college visit, so for many I might be a new face. And so you might be asking the question, who am I? Which I guess is actually another way to ask the question, what is my life? Well, I was born in Glasgow and grew up there, so I'm very much a proud Scotsman. Yet I've lived a quarter of my life in England, in Manchester. I'm also married to an American from California, so in some senses our home is multicultural. I also started out studying law and philosophy, moving on to a marketing master's and thought a life in business lay ahead, but then I ended up working for a youth charity, partnering with churches and social action projects. From there I took up studying theology and became a part-time associate pastor for a couple of years, and I finally completed my doctorate in theology just last year. So since 2015 I've been lecturing at the Scottish Baptist College, and currently I'm also taking a postgraduate certificate. In higher education. Much of my family is in Glasgow and I'm a brother, a son, a husband, an uncle and so on. Recently I've also become a puppy parent which is consuming much of my spare time in these past few weeks. In some ways that all begins to scratch the surface of who I am and what is my life and yet it still doesn't convey the whole of it. It says very little of my beliefs those deep convictions which transcend simple opinion and become the things that drive my decision making. These convictions are the stuff of justice and compassion, the things that drive my passions and consume my energies and lie beneath the core ideas and shape my identity. And it's towards these types of convictions that the book of James begins to address. It's not really easy to give an overview of the book of James. First, the author is disputed, largely because James was a common name in the ancient world. But it's clear that the author held a prominent and respected place in the church in Jerusalem. This in itself lends the book some authoritative weight. Second, the book does not follow a clear pattern. Unlike many of Paul's letters, the book of James does not seem to have a central theme or a consistent pattern. And again, unlike Paul's letters that gain specificity in context, it's not altogether clear the intended audience of the book of James, beyond that they were members of the early church. The best approximation is perhaps to say that the book of James was sent from a person of authority in the early church to the dispersed Jewish Christ followers, but even this is a wide audience. Finally, it's hard to pin down the tradition that the book of James follows. There's elements of Matthew's Gospel in it, and there's a large influence of Jewish texts, but it doesn't clearly sit within any one of the early church traditions. Although it was received into the canon of scripture, its journey was longer and slower than other books of the Bible. But in some ways, we can put all of that to one side to say that the book of James is undeniably written by someone who is invested in encouraging Christ followers to seek the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that alone makes it a book worth considering closely. I want to briefly summarise the passage I've been handed before moving on to explore what that might mean for us today. What is our life in times of trials and temptations? To begin with, the passage primarily splits into three parts. Verse 2 to verse 8, verses 9 to 11, 
and finally from verse 12 to the beginning of verse 19. The first section deals with a response to trials. The second bridges between the first and the third, reminding us about the brevity of life, with the third section dealing with temptations in life. Throughout there are a number of comparisons, those who know God's faithfulness and those whose faith is elsewhere, those who are rich and those who are poor, those whose lives are fruitful and those whose lives are destructive. Many of the themes here are picked up throughout the rest of the book. For example, the relationship between the rich and the poor are introduced here and expanded upon in chapter 2 verses 1 to 7. The idea of facing trials is briefly explored in the opening verses of chapter 1, but then again more extensively in chapters 4 verse 13 on to chapter 5 verse 6. In short, these verses can be considered under the following headings. In verse 2 to verse 8, trials brought on by thinking we are in control and not God. In verses 9 to 11, trials are brought on by the oppression of the powerful over the powerless. And finally, the section closes by a call to remember God's goodness. To me, this passage can speak well into our present circumstances. But I think we have to listen carefully to theological wisdom so that we reap a good crop from this text and so that we avoid inadvertently gathering up weeds instead. My wife and I travelled back to see her family in California over New Year, arriving back in the UK in mid-January. It was a wonderful trip taking in San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge, a site that I've long wanted to visit. We travelled to the Gold Rush country in Northern California and to the Golden Sands of Southern California. Almost six months to the day as I write this, and the world is now a different place. Arriving back in the UK, there was just the very beginnings of rumours about a new virus spreading in China, and we thought very little of it. As time passed, we realised that we were fortunate that our travel plans had not been any later into 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic is the very definition of a trial, a trial on a global scale. In some sense inconceivable to the writer of the book of James and yet a good example of the relentlessness of trials that the author had in mind. It's hard to know exactly what trials the author was referring to, but there were definitely ones that required perseverance and wisdom. The response to the current pandemic has required both of those qualities on a personal and societal level. We've required perseverance and patience in maintaining the temporary safety measures for as long as necessary and perhaps more than necessary in order to protect the vulnerable in our society. And it's required wisdom to make good decisions for ourselves and others when there are unknowns and a rapidly evolving situation. But we have to be careful not to be too keen to quote these verses in the heat of the moment and end up with a strange characterisation of God. In verses 2, 3 and 4 we read, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It might be tempting to think that we should respond with joy for the opportunity it has brought to grow faith, but we should not. A pandemic of this scale should not inspire joy. It should not be something that we think is achieving God's purposes. The full witness of scripture should tell us that God does not rejoice in suffering, nor require suffering to achieve his purposes. God in Christ suffered not because he required the suffering to achieve his purposes, nor that he might glory in the suffering, but because he bore the brunt of the brokenness of humanity, so that he might reverse its consequences, and glory in the fullness of life that outweighed the suffering of non-existence. And so, when many thousands of people have died, many of them vulnerable, with the weight of the suffering bearing down on the poor and the already fragile, to suggest that God is somehow behind it is nothing short of callous. And yet trials and suffering happen. We know all too well that we live in a broken world and as humans we are a broken people. We don't need a pandemic to tell us this, 
but a pandemic shouts to us just how deeply rooted the brokenness is. In Romans chapter 8, we read of the groaning of all creation, a world that has been bound to decay by the waywardness of humanity, the very ones in creation that were supposed to care for it. The natural world is both beautiful and deadly, reflecting that humans are wonderfully made in the image of God and yet deadly through their brokenness that results in separation from the author of life. Along with humanity, the whole created order eagerly anticipates restoration when it is healed and brought back into the fullness of life that only God can bring. In this sense, God is the very antithesis of suffering. But because he is the very antithesis of suffering, and because he reverses the consequences of brokenness, nothing that happens in this world is beyond his redemption. And this is what the book of James is pointing towards. We must be careful to note that the writer does not say that we find joy in suffering, but rather we find joy in faith. Nor does he write that we should expect suffering to do the work, but that is perseverance that brings us to acknowledge the faithfulness of God. Therefore we do not rejoice in the suffering itself, but we find wholeness or completeness in the faithfulness of God who remains with us through the trials. So then, what is our life in times of trial? What is our life in times of COVID-19? I think as Christians we are called to be witnesses to the faithfulness of God. It is difficult in times of severe trial to know that God is close and furthermore it can become easy to blame God for the suffering we are enduring. But what we learn from verse 17 is that God is the giver of good things and that characteristic never changes. Therefore he is not and never can be the author of suffering and he does not bring about suffering and never will bring about suffering to achieve his purposes. In times of suffering our response should be of humility and sorrow, to acknowledge that all too often we, as humans, have bound and continue to bind the created order to practices that have disordered the goodness that God put into creation. But we cannot stay in the sorrowful places. As Christians, we must also witness to God's faithfulness, not tossed by the waves or blown off course by the winds of trials, but steadfast in the knowledge that God loves his creation and is faithful throughout. So what is, our what is our life in times of temptation? It's been seven years since the murder of Trayvon Martin in Florida, where George Zimmerman shot the young, unarmed black man for nothing more than because in his estimation he looked suspicious. It was as a result of this episode that the Black Lives Matter movement began and seven years later, once again we are in a moment where this movement has become front and centre to our social discourse. I am sad that seven years later the same issues abound, perhaps felt even more acutely at this time. However, I think it is important that this type of issue remains central to our fight to make society a better place for all and doesn't just slip away letting the status quo remain. I am fortunate. I am white, educated and employed, living in a country where this is the dominant demographic. Many of you listening will also fit this description. I have made good life decisions largely based on the fact that I have had the autonomy to make these decisions and the ability to evaluate these decisions. Not everyone is in the same position, often burdened by years, decades, centuries of systematic prejudice that limits their autonomy and alternatives. In many ways, I am the very definition of the type of person that the book of James describes in verse 10, who should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. And the implication is severe. The place of the privileged in the kingdom of God is precarious. The contrast between the rich and the poor is a running theme throughout the book of James, and though I don't want to spoil the upcoming weeks, there are two main ideas that arise from the book of James in this regard. The first is seen clearly in chapter 2, and it is that riches are no guarantee of goodness, and conversely, that those who do not use their wealth to help those less privileged are not bearers of the kingdom. It's easy to store up wealth for our own comfort, 
But the temptation is that this will replace God as our foundation and in turn cause us to ignore the plight of others. The second theme is seen both in chapter 2 and chapter 5 and comes from the social inequality caused by different economic situations. The book of James warns against getting too close to the wealthy who exploit the poor because it is too easy to then side with the oppressor rather than the oppressed. It can be attractive to be seen with those who have power, to cozy up to the movers and shakers. But the temptation is that we end up being sucked into that world and replacing God as our source of value and in turn devaluing those around us just so that we can get ahead. And it's important to recognise the subtlety in what the temptations are. It's not so much the temptation to get rich, but it's the temptation to replace God with the pursuit of wealth. It's not so much the temptation to be successful, but it's the temptation to be in a position of power, to oppress those who are powerless. What is at the heart of these warnings then is not wealth as such, but privilege and inequality. Of course, it is important to recognise that economic inequality is one of the most damaging forms of inequality, but in today's society it is often a symptom of deeper, wider ranging inequalities. We have to be careful that we don't vilify success, which may come with influence and wealth, at the expense of missing the bigger issue in play here, which is advocating for equality and challenging oppression. So then, What is our life in times of temptation? What is our life in times of the Black Lives Matter movement? I think as Christians we're called not just to recognise where there has been past inequality that has led to present systemic injustice, but we're called to stand alongside the oppressed, speak against the oppression and to create a better future. Should we support the removal of statues or the changing of street names? That perhaps requires a more nuanced answer than I have time for here. But I don't think as Christians we should ever support the glorification of oppression in the past or the present. As Christians, don't we think that all lives matter? It's true that the image of Christ is in every human and the presence of God throughout all creation. But as Christians, we shouldn't support the status quo when that keeps some people privileged while others are oppressed. In Christ we see modelled someone who shook up the social order so that those who were oppressed were raised up, inevitably meaning that those that were elevated were brought equal. Might we wonder if the Black Lives Movement really is our problem? Well, it's tempting to seek our own comfort, but what does that mean when that comfort is at the expense of others? It is tempting to do nothing when we are comfortable while others are fighting for the very air they breathe. These temptations, this desire, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And it may not just be our own death, though this might be the plain reading of the verse, but we may have inadvertently aligned ourselves with a system of injustice that it leads to unfair treatment and cries of I can't breathe. Those words, that death, should be a ringing in our ears as Christians, waking us up to seek justice not just for ourselves, but for all and in any situation where there is inequality and injustice. Shouldn't we just let the politicians and the police do their jobs, you might ask? It can be tempting to give praise to those in power who make our lives easy, while we turn a blind eye to those whose lives are made difficult. It's tempting to support those in positions of power that uphold my interests, my freedom of religion, my right to choose while they simultaneously deny these rights and freedoms to others. We have a dissenting tradition that does not need to validate our faith in the corridors of power, but rather seeks to hear the voice of the voiceless and bring freedom to the captive. Our faith leads us to protest in the face of injustice, and when we shun the oppressor in favour of upholding the oppressed, we find that we become a kind of first fruits of all he created. We begin to embody the kind of flourishing, diverse and peaceful community that we see in scripture, where there is every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. 
So what is our life in times of trial and temptation? I think these early verses from the book of James help us to give an answer. On the one hand, we're reminded that God is not the author of trials or suffering, nor is he the author of temptation or oppression. On the other hand, we're assured that God is compassionate and is close to the poor, the oppressed and the suffering. We can be confident that God's goodness will continue despite the trials and temptations, and more importantly, that God does not need to use the trials or temptations in order to achieve his good purposes. As we travel through this sometimes dark, sometimes painful world, we must remember that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God's love and goodness do not change, not in times of trial and temptation, not in, time, not in the times of James, not in the time of COVID-19 or Black Lives Matter. And it's up to us to be a witness to the goodness and love through our care for others and our passion. Words from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how good it is that we can come together to praise and thank you for all your good gifts. How blessed we are to be surrounded by the beauty of your creation. We just have to lift our eyes and see the hills, the trees, the birds and flowers, all of which come from your loving hand. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, for all the maths and science, if that's the right term, that allows us to use this technology to share our time together. We thank you. And we pray for those of our church family who can't join us in this format for worship. We pray that they may know your presence in a special way. And keep us mindful of their needs. Father, as restrictions are easing for us, we bring before you those nations who are on the depths of the pandemic and maybe don't have the facilities to cope. And for some, this comes on top of the crippling disasters of war and drought, and we feel helpless. Lord, lighten their darkness, we pray. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are often denied the help available in these situations just because they bear the name of Christ. Holy Spirit, give them courage. And for the Christian organisations ministering to those in need, we pray for wisdom in planning and for protection for the workers who often risk their lives to bring aid and comfort. Lord, give them strength to continue this work for the kingdom. And Father, give us compassion. Help us in our abundance not to be wasteful and to help where we can. We pray for our governments and leaders that they may have wisdom and clarity in decision making. Particularly want to pray for Christian MPs that their voices may be heard, especially in matters affecting our precious young people. We close with a prayer with some words I read recently. May we be refreshed and renewed by the life-giving power of God. When we are weary, may God give new vitality. When we are despairing, may God give us hope. May we live in the overflow of God's amazing grace. Amen. The Lord Almighty is our Father. He, he loves, loves us and, and tenderly cares for us. us. The Lord Jesus Christ is our Saviour. 
He He has has redeemed us and and will defend us to the end. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, is among us. She She will lead us us in God's holy way. To God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be praise and glory today and forever. Amen. Amen.